Good morning, friends. Did you see the moon and the lightning last night? Man, it was fantastic. I couldn't believe it. And part of the sky was clear. And here's this big, huge, gorgeous full moon lighting up everything. And half the sky was full of dark clouds and spectacular lightning. It was quite a show. It was quite a show. Uh, as we uh, get ready to um, worship together, um, let's use our resources to uh, gather our inward thoughts and recognize the presence of God within us and among us. And let's also start with sharing any announcements there might be. We'll start with the people on Zoom. If there's anybody on Zoom who has an announcement to share, go ahead and do it. Anyone on Zoom have any announcements? Nope, I guess not. So we'll come down here. <laughs> Uh, to the main meeting, and I'll start with an announcement of my own. Um, in the dining room, uh, there are three boxes full of boxes. I'm a compulsive saver. And uh, over the years, I have gathered a lot of gift boxes of a whole bunch of sizes and shapes. And I would really love it if other people would like to take some. <laughs> if you have any use at all for them, to, uh, help yourself. They're in the dining room. Have at it. Take as many as you can. <laughs> OK, anybody else? <laughs> This is Bill Smith. Um, just wanted to thank uh, the crew who came yesterday and got our meeting house ready for spring summer. Um, we had 10 people here. The Sprague family did the cemetery. He's our new sextant. And so they had, I think, six or eight people from that family who cleaned up all the old flowers and emptied the rain barrel to the big trash barrels and all that stuff. But uh, Rita Goss, Anita Kamek, jo Joanne Gully, Pam Smith, Jim McClung, Steve Blackader, Lee Comer, Larry Cordray, and Josiah Hostetler were all part of the crew. Thanks a lot, everybody. And let me just express my appreciation. As I've always said, the more people who show up for cleanup day, means I don't have to. So thank you for everyone who came out and worked. We want to thank you for not showing up. <laughs> <laughs> I told Bill on Friday to tell him I had to help Spencer on uh, Saturday and couldn't be there. And I noticed you did seem very relieved at that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements? That may be it. Oh God, we give thanks this morning and remember especially those who labor, who wake up each morning dedicated to fashioning and creating 
manufacturing, building, doing what they can to serve humanity through the simple gift of labor. We lament, O oh God, that we have not always appreciated such people and that at times we ourselves have thought it beneath us. And so we remember them especially today and ask that you deepen our appreciation for those who do such simple but essential things. Help us, O oh God, to value them for what they do and not to scorn them. And Lord, should we ever hold ourselves above them, remind us again and again that you have used such people to change the world and forgive our arrogance. We pray, O oh God, this morning for those who suffer grief. We pray for the families in Texas who lost loved ones to yet another round of gun violence. Lord, we are mystified and stymied and angry and speechless at this continued onslaught. <clears throat> Assist us, O oh God, to pick wise people to lead. Those who appeal not to our base instincts, but call us to live more nobly, more lovingly, more cooperatively with one another. Let us, O oh God, care less about our individual rights and more about our collective responsibilities so that with you we create a nation and a world in which all people are safe and can prosper. Forgive us, O oh God, of our idolatry of valuing ancient words over present people and circumstances. Speak, O oh God, to the hearts of those who so stubbornly refuse to cooperate for the greater good. And place within us all a spirit of grace and love so we and our children and grandchildren need not live in fear. We pray, O oh God, for those who lead, no matter their capacity, that they will care less about their personal gain about their privilege and power and care more about the beloved community in which they live. Forgive us, O oh God, when we are so easily turned. by their selfish claims and calls and place within our hearts a desire and thirst for all that is good and beautiful. 
remind us, O oh God, that all people are to be loved. But not all are called to lead. And so let us make it our life's work to commit ourselves to those persons who bring out the best in us and not the worst. Forgive us, O oh God, from our complacency, from despair, from pessimism, and place in our hearts hope and strength and persistence. Remind us, O oh God, that nothing good has ever happened without labor and intelligence and beauty and love. Let these be our clarion virtues as we live in this world. This is our prayer this first day morning. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing together our opening song, a very, a very hopeful song. How can I keep from singing? Worship in song number 245. I don't know if this is right, but I heard this song where it was sung by the old Quakers who would sing this song. So in that spirit of optimism, let's join our voices to theirs. <laughs> If you have not, please put your phones on airplane mode or turn them off. Whatever you want to do. So. Young people will come around with baskets, so if you have food to contribute, please do. 
this is part of our thankful sharing. There are other ways to support the community and uh, the variety of works that we're engaged in. Uh, you can uh, write a check or put some cash in uh, one of the baskets in the back, or you can go online and find out how to give online. But all of your donations are very, very, very helpful. And this is a generous community, so thanks and keep it up. My name. Last night's uh, sky show was very interesting, and it, uh, it reminded me that um, we all are always living with um, uh, things that are beautiful and awe-inspiring, um, and things that can be very dangerous and um, cause a lot of damage and hurt. Uh, and it challenges us to think about what do we do with the hard times? What do we do with the hard times? Um, and I, I must tell you, I, I am utterly amazed at what human beings manage to go through and cope with and come out well. And, and I feel like, I have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have much learning to do. I don't know how people live with the kind of chronic pain that I have seen or the losses and the devastation that they are experienced. And I think going through that, and it's not just individual things, it's uh, social things. Uh, there are an awful lot of us very stressed right now about the state of this nation and with good reason. And situations like that uh, challenge our ideas and our expectations about God. And sometimes they make us wonder if, I mean, we've all been taught that God is absolutely and fully in control of everything. And that raises some problems. <laughs> um, maybe God's not fully solely in control of things. Maybe he shares that with, uh, uh, with us and we have to make some choices. One thing we do know, the major message of the Judeo-Christian tradition is that God's promise is not necessarily work miracles and change, uh, uh, change everything, but it is to be with us as love no matter where we are or what's happening. Um, I'd like to share with you just a few thoughts um, that come out of practice and study and um, awe and try, trying to learn from people um, just how they do handle tough stuff. And, and it seems to me that one of our struggles is to keep our balance. It's balancing. It's never just static balance. We're, we're always in motion. Um, dealing with contrary forces. Uh, and, and our challenge is to be neither uh, Pollyannish and <clears throat> denying hurts, um, <clears throat> nor wallowing in self-pity hanging on to everything that hurts and confuses and makes us anxious. <clears throat> I would not make a good Buddhist, I don't think, um, <clears throat> because that the notion of um, simply trying to escape pain all the time um, doesn't work. I mean, there are boots practice, and I, I do not mean this as any kind of uh, put down of Buddhism. There's so much we can learn from that tradition. Um, but uh, 
merely trying to escape pain and not do anything to reduce the causes of pain, um, to really bring our hands and our hearts together uh, to do something about uh, uh, causes to people in pain and suffering. Um, I mean, part of coping with it is to be able to take action. But it includes when we are, when we're hit with something that's hard, um, <clears throat> recognizing that it's okay to be hurt and anxious or, and to grieve, to be able to acknowledge the pain for what it is and take a deep breath and recognize that we can survive it. I mean, I feel like it, <laughs> you know, I'd have a clue at first. <laughs> But uh, that uh, recognition and being able to name it is important. It's part of being able to process it. And breathing. Did you ever notice how when, when you're stressed, your breathing changes and often stops? Um, I, I, I know of times when I had to be reminded, Mary, breathe. <laughs> Um, and practicing um, attention to breathing is one of the ways to build a habit of um, being, being able to recognize uh, when you're short of breath and denying yourself of oxygen and making it harder on your body. Um, uh, pay attention to your body and let it work for you because it's miraculous. It, does, does its job very well. And um, a practice of mindfulness of being, and there are lots of ways to be mindful. Um, one of the most important uh, that sometimes we have a hard time talking about except in churches uh, is affirming divine love's presence which is so constant, uh, paying attention to the message that God is love, that's, uh, and that out of love and into love, we are made and sustained. Um, remem remembering, reminding ourselves of that uh, is a source of strength. Um, and sometimes it helps to, to uh, recall that if nothing else, this hard thing that we're going through will unite us, can unite us with the rest of the human family because all of us uh, have some experiences that uh, are unavoidable. Um, you're going to get hit with something that knocks you for a loop, uh, that hurts a lot, and that you have to process. Um, I believe that if you have, if you develop an orientation towards growing and learning all the time and recognizing that that's a key human resource, that the key process that we're involved in all the time. Um, is one of the most helpful things you can do. If you think of yourself as, I'm just, I'm this kind of personality, or I'm, uh, uh, this is the way I'm made, I, that's just the way it is. You put yourself in a position of uh, disempowering yourself and detaching from your own resources and from the divine resources that are part of us. Um, and there are some characteristics of, of folks who take on a growing learning orientation. They're inclined to see hard times as a challenge and an opportunity rather than something that inevitably defeats them. Uh, it challenges your sense of control and it makes you process that and think about uh, that, that whole, whole question of um, what can I change and what can I not? And recognizing that there are, are both to deal with. Um, 
but also makes us open um, to seeing things in new ways, um, thinking differently than we've been used to, and experimenting, trying to act in new ways and see what happens. One of the most powerful ways I think we have to, uh, of dealing with hard things is being creative. I don't know why adults get taught to think of themselves as not creative. Where do we lose that? Because I love watching it in kids, don't you? It, it's just wonderful to see three-year-olds and five-year-olds and what they do with their imaginations. That to t they make stories as they go, and, and it's all part of creating new skills and new knowledge. Um, and if we could capture some, if we could retain some of that, it would be helpful. We need to let ourselves play, play with ideas, play with uh, new behaviors, experiment, and, um, and recognize that we are creative. <laughs> Quit telling ourselves that, oh, I can't do that. Um, also, uh, uh, there are some things that, that uh, Phil has alluded to uh, before that I would like to uh, call attention to again. And the business of awe uh, and being able to walk in wonder. Look for the wonderful. It's all over the place. Um, last night was wonderful. Uh, I want to share a thought from the poet Mary Oliver along those lines. She said, <clears throat> my work is loving the world, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into things and a silence in which another voice may speak. Then she wrote this little three-line poem called Instructions for Living. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. <clears throat> John Philip Newell is a Celtic uh, theologian, spiritual teacher, and uh, in one of his, I think it's one of his newer books, I'm not quite sure, um, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, uh, makes a comment about uh, tuning in to the, the beauty, the power, and the life of nature uh, and how healing that is, how rejuvenating it is. If we are to see a true reawakening to the sacredness of the earth and harness the deepest energies of our being to serve this awareness, we need a strong inner authority in our own souls to challenge the religious, political, and social systems that have recklessly ignored or denied this sacredness and are imperiling the very future of the world our capacity to know the flow of the divine in all things. <clears throat> well, it's good to be back. I was at a Quaker pastor's retreat this week, which sounds as exciting, which was as exciting as it sounds to be with 40 Quaker pastors and uh, watch them let their hair down and act like Pentecostals for a couple of days. We had a very good time. And then last weekend, Joanne and I were gone. We went down to the farmhouse and um, to work outside, cleaning away the dross of winter. 
picking up fallen, fallen sticks, raking the flower beds, mowing the yard, weed whipping around the barns, and sweeping the porches. And our favorite thing to do in spring, opening the windows to let the breeze blow through and refresh the house. Is there no better feeling ever in the world? I think of that wind coming off of the Rocky Mountains and across the Great Plains, across Kansas and Iowa and Illinois, into Indiana, scouring everything clean, including the dust balls in our farmhouse that swirl around before getting sucked up by our vacuum cleaner and carried outside to the trash can, out with the old and in with the new. Spring is a good time to make plans. This past March over spring break, we went to Kentucky. Joanne and I did to visit Joanne's brother, Jack, who has Parkinson's disease. And while we were there visiting, Jack uh, put me in charge of his ashes distribution. He's a very organized man uh, and also very matter of fact about it. Uh, the Apple family faces the challenges of life directly without drama. Uh, there's a grove of trees uh, in the upper meadow across the road from our farmhouse and, and Jack told me that he wanted me to bury his ashes there in the old family cemetery. And I thought to myself, what old family cemetery? I've been up in those woods for 40 years and I've never seen them. So he told me where it was and Joanne and I spent part of last weekend looking for it up there in the woods and eventually found some square hand-hewn stones that could possibly have been tombstones, headstones, and we found an old quarry from which the foundation stones for the apple houses and barns had been dug and cut some 150 years ago. It was very interesting. It's a humbling thought to stand amidst a family graveyard deep in the woods and remember how simply and directly our ancestors faced death. Things have certainly changed. Linen shrouds and pine boxes have given way to custom caskets built far away by people we don't know. Family graveyards in woodlots and pastures have been replaced by well-groomed cemeteries. Shovels wielded by family and friends have gone by the way, replaced by the excavator, expertly wielded by the men from the burial vault company who stand respectfully off to the side until everyone is gone before filling in the grave of someone they never knew. We pay people to do things we used to do for ourselves, except for the Apple family. I fully expect, this is my prediction, that Joanne's brother will drive himself to the family farm the week before his death, where he will dig the hole for his ashes and then pry out a boulder from the quarry, hew it into a rectangle, then chisel his name on it, which in a way is a great way to face suffering and death. When faced directly, they lose their sting. We've been talking lately and dwelling on this whole topic of uh, uh, the, the basic tenets of the Christian faith in light of the rise of uh, Christian nationalism, which we've all looked at and said to ourselves, how is that Christianity? Well, it isn't. It isn't. But how did we get there? Well, we got that way, way through bad theology. Um, Christian nationalism is both a distortion of Christianity and a renunciation of America's noblest virtues. Uh, one focus of Christianity, indeed, a focus of almost every religion uh, has been to answer the question of suffering. Uh, why do we suffer? Now, traditionally, you know, Christians have said we suffer 
uh, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, because of humankind's inherently sinful nature. Um, that before sin, we were strangers to suffering and evil, but then sin opened the door to calamity and pain and disease and death and all these horrible things. And if you know me, and if you've been paying any attention to anything I've ever said in the past 22 years here, you know that I thoroughly reject that absurdity. I thoroughly reject it. It makes no sense to me, which doesn't mean I reject suffering. Suffering is very real. And our response to it shapes and fashions how we live together. Consequently, Christian nationalism can't be fully uh, explained by racism, which we're quick to do. Well, that's just racism at work. Well, yeah, that's one of the causes. And it can't totally be explained by ignorance or fascism. It also must be explained by grief. Wherever Christian nationalism has raised its head, grief and fear were dominant factors, either grieving a perceived loss of privilege and power or grieving a perceived loss of identity and status behind every movement of racism and fascism can be found someone grieving the loss of something they thought essential to their well-being. I believe this is true not only for individuals, but for cultures and countries. Underneath, underneath the rant of anger is invariably found the wail of loss and suffering. The only way around this is to always remind ourselves of two great truths. Suffering is inevitable and no one is exempt. No one. To live is to suffer. To live is to experience loss. There is simply no avoiding it. There have been persons in my life who I have looked at from a distance and envied, envied, thinking that from what I could see, their lives were perfect. Beautiful home, bright children, wealth, good health, popularity, hair. <laughs> they had it all. But every time I have felt that way about someone, I have eventually learned that even their lives had seasons of suffering and loss. Even their lives. Everyone, every person I have ever met, suffering is inevitable. No one is exempt. And if we believe we are exempt, if we believe we deserve to sit squarely at the top of life's heap, untouched by hardship or tragedy, then suffering, when it finally and inevitably visits us, will twist and deform us and maybe even break us. There is no person so angry and broken as the person who thought themselves exempt from hardship or suffering, who thought themselves superior, invincible, and now knows otherwise and cannot bear it. But suffering is, is inevitable, no one is exempt. I remember uh, when sociologists first announced that at the current rate of uh, birth and immigration, the United States would no longer be a majority white nation by the year 2045. And I remember thinking to myself, isn't that fascinating? 
Isn't that fascinating? That is wonderful. That will spice things up. All kinds of people from everywhere. How fun will that be? More personally, I thought of pale, pasty gullies. <laughs> marrying exotic people from other cultures and having the most gorgeous grandchildren. Couldn't we all use a little more color? Yes, I think we can. But what I welcomed, what I anticipated and looked forward to with deep interest was seen by others as a threat to their privilege and they began to march chanting, you will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. As if the universe should act to suit them. As if the universe should change its direction to keep them on top. As if cultural trends should ground to a halt to accommodate them. There is no person so angry and broken as the person who thought themselves superior and now knows otherwise and cannot bear it. Theology 101, suffering is inevitable. No one is exempt. No one is exempt. Hmm. It isn't because our ancestors disobeyed God. It is because we are human and we are alive. And to be alive in this world is to know not only great joy and happiness, but also great pain and loss. Those who are spiritually healthy learn from their suffering and do not resent it nor do they spend their life trying to avoid pain at any cost. They learn that they are not always protected from difficulty. And when they learn that and accept that, when we learn that we're not always protected from difficulty and when we accept that, we become more wholly human, more fully alive, more loving, more mature, and ironically, even more joyful. <laughs> it isn't suffering that makes us sad. It isn't suffering that makes us sad. It is our continued anger about our suffering that depresses us and weighs us down. Suffering needn't be the death of our joy. Indeed, when accepted and thoughtfully engaged, suffering can become the doorway through which wholeness and joy are found. If hearts are clear, let's pick up the other hymnal, <laughs> sing joyfully, um, and turn to, to number 542. Oh, Master, let me walk with the standard table. <coughs>
spouses care for one another, where everyone knows the joy of family love, where creation is honored and tended well and beautifully, where world leaders sit down and talk rather than build armies and fight. Think for a moment of everyone having enough to eat, someone to love, someone to care for and be cared for. Think of that world. This week, friends, let us create that world. Let us create the family we have always dreamed of having let us create the neighborhood in which we've always wanted to live. Let us create the towns and cities that make us happy and bring joy to others. Let us create a state that honors all people. And let us create a nation that reveres and respects the wide spectrum of God's creation. And finally, friends, working together, let us create a world in which all people everywhere are known and loved and cherished. This is our work this week. This is our holy calling to create such a beautiful and wonderful world. Let's roll up our sleeves. Amen. Turn and greet friends.